Now, this weekend, I received the largest response to any column I think I've ever written. My weekly column runs in all of the Sun newspapers, Tirana, Ottawa, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg. So that's a lot of readers. But this response was, well, extraordinary. Now, here is what I wrote. I haven't been asked to lead any marches at Pride this year, and frankly, I doubt that's ever likely to happen. I'm still regarded by many in the gay community as an enemy, and I understand that reaction. I've said and written things in the past that, while never intentionally hateful, caused offence and pain. This isn't necessarily relevant in that truth cannot change according to response, but I could and would not say such things any longer. I was wrong. In the past six months, I've been parachuted into clouds of new realisation and empathy regarding gay issues, largely and ironically because of the angry and hateful responses of some people to my defence of persecuted gay men and women in Africa and Russia. I saw an aspect of the anti-gay movement that shocked me. This wasn't reasonable opposition, but a, a tainted monomania with no understanding of humanity and an obsession with sex rather than love. I'm used to threats and abuse, and as someone who has just completed a book about Islam's treatment of Christians and has campaigned for years for beleaguered Christians in the Muslim world, I am immune to verbal attacks and even death threats. But this was different. I was accused of betraying my faith. The thing is, I have evolved my position on this issue, not in spite of, but precisely because of my Catholicism. My belief in God, Christ, the Eucharist, and Christian moral teaching are stronger than ever. Goodness, I'm even trying to forgive those Christians who are trying to have my speeches cancelled and have devoted pages on their websites and blogs to my apparent disgrace. The other attack is to argue that I have surrendered to pressure or that my children have influenced me. Well, this is absurd to be genuinely funny. My kids, they're not political, they respect and love me and would anyway never waste their time trying to change my mind. That they're accepting of gay people and gay marriage is axiomatic. They're aged 16, 20, 24 and 25. And whether you like it or not, that generation in the West simply does not comprehend opposition on these issues. I spoke to Brent Hawkes, this was not in the column, Grand Marshal of World Pride last week, and he said this, it's extremely perceptive. I met recently with some, some more evangelical Christians and talking about how do we build that bridge, how do we have a dialogue. I frankly gave up on them a long time ago because yeah. I was just so busy and it was often very hateful. And so therefore I said, like, I need to just focus and not get involved. But that was wrong. I should have kept trying to build the bridge over these years and, and I didn't. But what we see is the public opinion polls are telling us that young evangelicals aren't concerned anymore about someone's sexual orientation. They're not concerned anymore about some of those issues. They're concerned about poverty, the environment mm -hmm. and the other issues. So I think it's a generational divide too. Hmm. Now, back to the column. As for pressure, you clearly don't know me. I've never compromised because of intimidation, even when it comes to some genuinely violent and serious people. It's tragic, but indicative, that there are critics who cannot come to terms with growth and change, and rather than considering what I have to say, try to question my motives. No, I have evolved on this single subject because I can no longer hide behind comfortable banalities. I've realised that love trumps judgement and know that the conversation between Christians and gays has to transform, just as has to a large extent the conversation between conservatives and gays. I'm not prepared to throw around ugly terms like sin and disordered as if they were clumsy cudgels, not prepared to marginalise people and groups who often lead more moral lives than I do. I'm sick and tired of defining the word of God by a single and not even particularly important subject. If we live, we grow. The alternative is, of course, death. That was it. That was the column. Not especially radical, I thought, but apparently some people concluded otherwise. Thousands of email postings, tweets and the rest. Most were lovely and kind. Others were critical or confused, but most of those who disagreed with me, they were downright abusive and incredibly nasty, and they're still coming in. My motives were questioned, my children accused, accused, remember, of being gay. I was a sellout, I was a heretic. One man, whom I actually know, wrote about me on his blog and, and, and started his diatribe with a description of the rape and murder of a little boy about 37 years ago by a gay man. And good Lord, what has that got to do with anything? The vast majority of sex-related crimes and murders are heterosexual. And anyway, my call was for love and understanding. It has no bearing at all on a vile, sadistic crime. Guilt by association. Yes, I've read the Bible. Yes, I've studied it. Yes, I know what Sodom was really about, what Paul was really saying in his letter to the Romans. I'm not a fanatic. 
I'm still pro-life, I'm still moral, I hope, still conservative on, on, on many issues, actually. I simply want to expunge extremism, ugly language, dangerous cliches, and twin solitudes from all of this. So, attack away, guys, if you want to. But remember, when you do, you let yourselves and you let God down far more than you hurt me. World Pride is about all of the people that are still suffering and being killed as re just for being homosexual. So, it, again, I'm glad we have the opportunity to party in Toronto, and I'm hoping that people all over the world have the same opportunity someday and not be killed just for being homosexual. Quite so, but what were those ladies doing in the background? So, was the column really so provocative and was the response justified? Journalist and signed-up member of the World Gay Conspiracy, <laughs> Rob Solona, joins us to discuss. Well, you were on the show just about a week, week and a half yep. ago, and uh, you didn't know I was going to write this column. But are you surprised at the reaction? Uh, no, no, I'm not. Uh, these, are, um, these sorts of reactions have been common in the gay community for uh, decades. Mm. Um, you know... Whenever someone came out uh, in support, there were always these uh, this backlash. It's still ongoing. If you look in uh, in America, you still see uh, you know sort of extreme fringe groups uh, like, despite their name, Million Moms, mm. uh, the Million Moms organization. Uh, you know, just a couple years ago, tried to lead a boycott campaign to get Ellen fired from ABC from her talk show. How did that go down? It did not work. <laughs> no, sure. It didn't work. In fact, it, it drew a lot more attention to uh, to what Ellen was doing, and and uh, so sometimes sometimes these things. Uh, these things backfire and uh, let me ask about that because I, mean, I don't watch that much TV but she's funny and talented I don't see her campaigning on her show all the time about lesbianism or gay rights I mean she hadn't she's she's gay but she's she's there because of her talent not because of her sexuality surely absolutely absolutely but you know uh, this sort of fringe organization perceives any sort of promotion of uh, you know, I guess seeing Ellen as a role model or any sort of, you know, person who's on daytime television as being, mm. uh, you know, they think of it as an attack on, on their values, on their, yeah, uh, yeah. what they perceive America to be about. And, uh, and they certainly, they've, they've led these, uh, these boycott campaigns against all sorts of uh, people, um, you know, companies, all sorts of things. You're going to think me very naive. I, I, I don't think I am, really. I mean, I've reported on war zones. I've seen people killed in front of me, um, shocking at first, you sort of become immune, which is even worse, I suppose. But I, th I thought I, I knew how things work. I knew there was um, reasoned opposition to same-sex marriage, which I think is a different issue still from, from being homophobic. I didn't realize how many people were, frankly, obsessed with the issue. Um, I hadn't suddenly said, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in, in Jesus as a Messiah, I reject all church teaching. I, uh, I, on, on one relatively small issue, I've said I want a totally different conversation and I want love, lack of judgment, empathy, bridges built. And it, it, is, it was as though I, I had, I don't know, just you know, brought the devil on the show to, 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 give a, to give a monologue. It was really quite shocking to me. Well, that's, that's unfortunately, that's the nature of fanaticism and extremism. And, uh, you know, you will see these in all sorts of different walks of life. But, uh, you know, in terms of the, the people who have become obsessed with, uh, with homosexuality, with uh, queer issues uh, across the spectrum, mm. um, you know, they they just, they can't let go of anything. Every little bit has to be something to fight about and it has to be, you know, uh, <laughs> raining hellfire on whatever it is they're trying to, uh, uh, the, the, the activists are trying to do. Mm. So, uh, you know, calling for tolerance, um, particularly in an audience that has, if, if uh, a certain segment of, of that audience has come to see you as being Part of uh, part of their side, I yeah. guess, if you want to put it that way. Yeah, that, that's very perceptive, actually, because I, I'm I'm sorry I've, I've hurt some people, but uh, <laughs> saying sorry again, but they have, I suppose, seen me as being on their side. I don't think it's about sides. Um, I'm not moving away from any one group of people. I might be changing the way I, I, I communicate about certain issues, but. Um, as I say, I have been, but this isn't about me, for goodness sake. That's not mm -hmm. relevant. The point is, um, there is a changing world. Generationally, there's, be, there's been a, a radical transformation in the West. I, mean, I think the real issue for gay people now has nothing to do with North America, really. It's to do with Africa and the developing world where people are, are still murdered uh, because they're gay, uh, have to live in hiding. They're, you know, 
quite some time ago, I watched uh, Stephen Fry, who is an amazingly gifted man. I mean, he can be annoying at times, but a very, very gifted man, a very intelligent man, interviewing a totally apolitical um, young woman with no power in Uganda who was gay. I don't think she'd ever considered politics. I mean, it was hard enough just getting through life. She was raped to cure her. She was thus infected with HIV. She couldn't go to a clinic that was in any way empathetic towards gay people because that's against the law in Uganda. And when I saw things like this and said, this is, devil, this is satanic, this is hellish, every Christian has to oppose this, what stunned me was how many people said, why should we? And I, that does not, that, I know not every Christian thinks like that, but for God's sake, and I mean that literally, for God's sake, we have to change the channel. I, 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 uh, I agree. I kind of want to back up a little bit. I, I do think it's important to say that, uh, you know, gay people, especially trans people, still face incredible violence here in North America. Mm -hmm. It's not just a developing world uh, issue. Um, yes, we've we've made a lot of uh, uh, you know. It's illegal to be gay in large parts of Africa. Yes, no, I'm 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 not uh, diminishing you know the struggles of of those people at all. And certainly over the past week during uh, Pride here, I've seen I, I met you know activists and delegates from uh, all over the world, from Kenya, from Jamaica, from Georgia, who told me you know their stories of trying to organize mm -hmm. in these countries and and you know the the absolute uh, danger that they they put their lives in mm -hmm. just to you know the march the organizers of Kiev Pride, uh, telling me that uh, you know they, they put themselves in danger to have a little celebration sure, of a couple sure. hundred people. No, I, I know what you mean. I mean, but, the, the, but, the, it's not uh, over in the right. West. Either. But I but that. I think uh, kind of getting back to what you right, were right. saying, um, I think there there does need to be a dialogue uh, from uh, across all groups because uh, you know there it, it has sort of broken yeah. into these two teams that are. It really has. Well, I, I think with with the, the new papacy. Uh, I, I think with uh, some new arguments that are coming forward from people like Steve Chalk in the UK, a leading evangelical and others, I think there is going to be a change. A and, um, and those people, and I guarantee after this, that th this will do the rounds now, this interview, and they'll all be watching it, and they'll be sitting there praying for me and pitying my poor wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, golly. But I, I'm still very optimistic, I have to be. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me on.